your attention, please. It is a real joy to have with us this afternoon for the first time at Preparedness Expos, a gentleman whom I have heard of for a long time but never personally heard lecture, but he comes with very high recommendations, John Quaid. John Quaid is a well-known author, has appeared in more than 120 featured films, television shows, including Roots uh, and a number of other movies. Uh, let's give a real hand of applause, if you will, to John Quaid. So good to have him at Preparedness Expo. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening to the resident alien subject slaves, Queen, Queen Hillary and her co-queen Billary. Send greetings from Clintonia. Turn out the lights, the new Camelot has arrived. I've often wondered, what does it feel like to be raped? You know, you, you, I've seen Hollywood's idea of it, but, and I've even, you know, for money, done that once or twice myself, but I don't mean in that sense. I'm talking about being raped where it counts the most, intellectually and spiritually and in your property, in your person, in your children, in everything you think you own. There's been a great deal of confusion in recent years concerning what the nature of the American system is. It always bothered me when I, you know, I'd hear these Yahoo's, you know, come out and talk about democracy and all these kinds of things, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm not the brightest man in the world, all right, but I never pledged allegiance to any democracy, and I never understood what they were talking about, because when I read the philosophers, Montesquieu, Rousseau, Voltaire, the Enlightenment thinkers, when I read Plato and Aristotle, when I read all of these great minds and everything, I see that they nowhere discuss democracy in any sense that we know it today. And so when I begin to look at the current state of what we call the United States of America, and compare it to democracy, I see no resemblance to what democracy really is, because democracy is vox populi, vox dei, the will of the people is God, right? 51 people vote on a question, out of 100, it's law. Now, they can change their mind the next day and vote the other way, and that becomes just as valid a law as it was the first day. In the kind of democracy I see, on... Monday, it's illegal to murder. On Tuesday, there's extenuating circumstances, of course. Now, on, well, well, on Wednesday, there could be some... You see, the, the, there's some psychological problems here because of the upbringing. On Thursday, the uh, victim is accused of the crime. And on Friday, it becomes legal to murder. Now, that's what I see as a modern democracy, but then again, that doesn't have anything to do with politics. Now, if anybody in this room is not confused by this time as to what I'm talking about, then you come up here and make the speech, because everyone is supposed to be confused at this point. Because speaking out of both sides of our mouth is the classical modern way of the politicians. When they talk about constitutional rights, they, do, they mean none of the rights given to us in the blood, sweat, and tears of the fathers when they gave us the Constitution. They mean 
none of those rights. They mean 14th Amendment privileges that can be given or taken away. Now, wait a minute. Rights, privileges, what's the difference? Very simply, rights come from God, privileges come from man. Choose this day whom he will serve. Choose this day under what kind of system you would prefer to live. Most people today, when they talk about rights, they, they mean it really in the terms of the right to sue that turkey for everything he's got. I mean, he ran over my brand new patent leather shoes. Well, that's a crime. I'm going to sue that turkey for everything. Of course, the attorney ends up with it all. And then the guy comes back after he's gone through this long process, and he says, my rights have been violated by the attorney, except that I can't sue him. Well, you idiot. You sign a contract with an attorney, and you're automatically declared non compass mentis. And he says, non what? I said, non uh, uh, you're not mentally competent. And he says, what? Well, my rights have been taken away again. Do you really know what your rights are? Do you know the difference between rights and privileges? Does anybody really know in America today? And are these worth fighting for, much less dying for? Well, let's put it this way. The fathers of our country understood the distinction. We are supposed to stand on their shoulders. If they felt that it was worth dying for, then perhaps we ought to reevaluate our current stance. A guy was asking me the other night, a very good friend of mine who's been in the battle with me for quite a while now, and he said, John, why don't we have any great leaders anymore? because we don't deserve them. Lord Bishop Cranmer said in the 13th century, it takes a strong people to maintain a good society. Only a weak people can begat an evil society. Lord Bishop Cranmer's voice, voice from the grave, then stands as an indictment against every single one of us today. And everyone's talking about rights, when in reality, there's no person that I know of in this room who has any, at least not according to the Constitution. You may have 14th Amendment rights, but those are all privileges granted by Congress. A privilege is something that can be granted and taken away at the whim of the grantor, you see. Now, how many citizens do we have here in, 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 in the place now? Oh, I love that. <laughs> you twit, shut up, this is my speech. I'm supposed to make that distinction, all right? Well, now he's blown it. He's got the cat out of the bag. I know, coming to a preparedness expo, I should have known there might be at least one or two of them here. No, what this dude back here in the back is talking about is really very simple. When I came out and said good evening and greetings to the resident alien subject slaves, I didn't intend it to be humorous. Because in point of fact, at law, you have no standing as a citizen of a state, and you have certainly no standing at law as a citizen of the United States. You say, but how can that be? The answer is really very simple. If you have a contract with any form of civil government, it's an adhesion contract in which you give up, by implication, all constitutional protections. You change your status, give up your rights, and accept privileges. 
which the politician can give and take away from you. I had a friend of mine the other day, got burned by the IRS, and he says, John, what was I going to do? What was I going to do, man? These guys are beating down my door. They're threatening me and everything else, and just, you know, and my lawyer said, obey. Do what they tell me. That's the only way I can get out of it. I said, what privilege or benefit or immunity were you drawing that gave the IRS some kind of jurisdiction? And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. Then I said, you deserve to pay. And he said, all right, you explain it to me. And I said, you got a Social Security card in your pocket? And he said, yeah, everybody does. I, I don't. And he says, you don't? And I said, no, I'm not going to take any benefit, privilege, or opportunity from the government. And he says, you mean federal government? I said, no, the state government, or the federal government, or the county or the city government. He said, only if you do that do they have jurisdiction. Only if you do that do you give up your rights and accept and swap for privileges. And he says, yeah. Right, I suppose you ain't got no driver's license either. And I said, wait a minute. As a matter of fact, I don't. And he says, wait a minute, wait a hold it, wait a hold it. And he jumps up off the couch and goes running outside and runs out to my truck, my van, you know, and sticks bound behind it. And he says, you ain't got no license plates on your truck, John. And I said, really? I I didn't know that. And he ran up to the driver's side of the truck, and he looks in, you know, looking for the sun visor, and he's going to pull it down, you see, because that's where the registration is supposed to be. See, it's up there on the sun visor. He looks in there, and he... John? You... You didn't... Your vehicle, it's not registered? And I said, no, I have quiet title on all my property. I'm a citizen at law. The God of Scripture is my authority. And he says, oh, come on, John, don't mix any of this religion in law. And I said, look, let me explain something to you. I said, now, this is going to get a little philosophical, and I know you're a public school graduate. Uh, two years at... <laughs> Two years at UCLA, and no comment, and two years at UCLA, and, and thus there's a certain degree of intellectual, uh, well, to be more genteel about it, he suffers from advanced epistemological myopia. <laughs> but anyway, I'll, I may explain that to you later, and I love it. But anyway, uh, uh, he said, he said, what, 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 are you, what are you trying to tell me, John? And I said, what I'm trying to tell you, partner, is that you've opted for benefits, privileges, and opportunities instead of rights that come from God. And that all law is religious. The only difference between systems of law is the gods of the dominant religion wherein the law originated. Thus, any change in law is an express or implied change in religion. All thought's religious. All thought creates its own system of law. And if it's illegal to murder on Monday and legal on Friday, then obviously we've got some kind of relativism here that kind of changes and shifts with the fluid with the time, you know, and everything else, but there's no fixed standard. So why even talk about law? Why even talk about rights? Well, I don't know why anyone else talks about law and rights in the Constitution, but I can give you my reasons. Because of guys like Randy Weaver, because of friends of mine that came back in a body bag from Nam and 
never understood why they died. Because of those in Iwo Jima, the Ardennes Forest, the charge of San Juan Hill, at Gettysburg, and Valley Forge, and Plymouth Rock. This is the heritage and the tradition that we have been given, and in it was law, the law of God, and we gave it up and sold our birthright for a mess of pottage, and if it continues, our children are not only already resident alien subject slaves, they will all grovel and have their property arbitrarily taken at the whim of any two-bit petty bureaucrat who can't decide which wrist he wants to inflect with, who can't decide which young child out there he wants as his personal plaything for a week or two. And a friend of mine one time got very hostile because he said, John, you're talking about imposing religion, Christianity, and law. You're supposed to render under Caesar the things that are Caesar and the things that are God to God. And I said, you're a little bit confused, my friend, because in this system, we are Caesar. The people are the supreme law of the land. The rest he wants to inflect with who can't decide which young child out there he wants as his personal plaything for a week or two. And a friend of mine one time got very hostile because he said, John, you're talking about imposing religion, Christianity, and law. You're supposed to render under Caesar the things that are Caesar and the things that are God to God. And I said, you're a little bit confused, my friend, because in this system, we are Caesar. The people are the supreme law of the land. <laughs> Governments exist by consent of the governed. And by the power of God, they will stay there and Bill Clinton and his queen will inflict their judgments upon us because we deserve them. Does anybody, has anybody ever turned over a voter's registration card and actually read the back of it? What does it say? You must be a resident of the United States. You know what the United States are talking about? You know what resident means? You know what domicile means? How it applies in opposition to resident? Resident of the United States, people, is someone who signed a Social Security agreement, gotten their driver's license, and then, by registering to vote, has pledged their property for the error of politicians. In other words, they place a lien on your physical person and all your property when you go down to register to vote. But then, we've got to do our public duty. Now. I don't know how many of you knew that or not. But the bottom line again is accept any benefit, privilege, or opportunity and you lose your rights and then accept privileges. When you enter into your adhesion contracts, call it Social Security, which apparently Americans would rather have than the security of God's providence. Guys get all over my case because I don't have a driver's license. I say, John, suppose everybody runs around without a driver's license. I said, fine, they'd own property for a change. What do you mean? I own property. My car's paid for out there. I own that. I said, really? Well, bring your title over here. I'll, let me look at it. I want to see somebody that really owns a car. So he brings his title over to me, you know. He brings this pretty little pink thing over lays it there on the table and says, there it is. Uh, Bob, uh, this is pink first. Uh, it's not a legal document. 
And I said, across the top of it, what does it say? Certificate of title. Certificate of title, Bob, is not the title. The title to your car when you first bought it, new, you voluntarily gave up your title when the automobile dealer said, we'll be glad to right here, just sign right here, and we'll take care of all the paperwork of registering your property with the state. Uh, right there, just a little small B. Uh, 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 no. And what you just did was you signed away title of your car to the state, which the state holds as surety for your compliance to the motor vehicle code. Isn't it nice? Huh? Isn't it lovely? And he said, wait a minute. You mean to tell me I worked for five years to pay for that damn station wagon out there, and you're telling me I don't own it? Well, I'll tell you what. You got about half an hour. Go in here and sit down and read these court decisions and the statutes. Well, people like that only learn the hard way. You see, like the gentleman I was talking to out on the convention floor out here who's been battling the IRS for years, IRS liens for years. He doesn't realize that he gave up his property. And apparently the pain level is not high enough that he's willing to take some kind of drastic action like revoking his Social Security card. Are rights really worth dying for? Can anyone answer that question? Are they worth dying for? Is there that much uncertainty in the crowd, in the audience? No, I mean, you know, when Henry stands in the house of Burgesses, and he says, I know not what course other men may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. He's merely paraphrasing the scriptures in which Joshua says, do as you will, but as for me and my house, we will follow the Lord. Well, again, we're right back in religion again. Well, that's where we get our rights from, people. It's from God. It's not a premise. It's not a theory. It's not a hypothesis. It's an actual, provable, historical fact. I could care less what the university professors are going to tell you. I could care less what the politicians are going to tell you. If you're willing to go back and spend a little bit of time, look at the original sources, you'll find out for yourself that 64% of the Constitution is either reasoned directly from statements made in Deuteronomy or from commentaries on the book of Deuteronomy. That was proven in a seven-year study done by the University of Houston almost ten years ago. They couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. 15,284 sources. You know, I mean, I've, I've had friends of mine talk all the time about how, you know, God had a hand in the Constitution, but you say, how and in what way? Well, you know, the founding fathers were Christians, but how and in what way? What's the connection between the Bible and the Constitution? The connection is the common law. The common law? <laughs> yeah, John, that's where, <laughs> that's where a man and woman kind of, you know, they're like live together a little bit without benefit of the preacher having said words over them, right? No. Common law marriage is a marriage at law in which you sought no benefits, privileges, or opportunities from the state. Common law marriages, all marriages in this country down to the later, latter 1880s and early 1900s were common law marriages. Pastors still said the words, but the couple was issued a certificate of marriage. Not a marriage license. No, marriage licenses only came in when people of different races wanted to marry. Now, what is the significance? Roberts v. Roberts, the United States Supreme Court decision, will tell you that when you go down and apply for a marriage license, the state becomes a third party to your marriage. And that, my friends, is why the state can come in and take your children take your property, can adjudicate in the matters of your divorce in the event that such a thing happens because you voluntarily signed your way. You got a license from men. And you gave up the right to a conjugal relationship 
at law. Now, that doesn't make any sense to me. Why would anybody in their right mind do anything like that? Clearly, we're not in our right minds, are we? Everything's got to have a license attached to it, and that means every time you get a license, you lose a right. And you do it voluntarily. Unknowingly, maybe, but you do it voluntarily. And that's the fundamental problem. Utter and total ignorance of what's going on in the process. And we're ignorant in the second place because we're ignorant of Scripture in the first place. And now I'm going to burn a few people's ears. Because I spent 20 years of my life reading and studying the Scriptures. And I spent over $80,000 in buying source materials. I got 7,000 titles in my library. And I don't have any fiction in my library. And the Lord gave me the privilege of studying for 18 years. And I finally come around to a knowledge and a realization that the common law is biblical law applied. And I say that only because I can establish beyond question that the common law itself was derived from the applications of canon and biblical law by the Christian churches. And I don't have any fiction in my library. And the Lord gave me the privilege of studying for 18 years. And I finally come around to a knowledge and a realization that the common law is biblical law applied. And I say that only because I can establish beyond question that the common law itself was derived from the applications of canon and biblical law by the Christian churches in England in the 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th centuries. That's where the common law come from. Because Christians had the, the uncommon temerity to actually want to live the way the Bible told them to. That's where the common law came from. That same law is the law they brought to this country. The Constitution, people, in case any of you are confused or are university professors, the Constitution of the United States is an instrument of common law procedure. But I thought common law just had get, get out of here. Alexis de Tocqueville in Democracy in America. He comes to this country in the 1830s, you know, to do some study and research for the French judicial and prison system. And he's traveling all over the colonies and he goes out west and everything else. And you can and he, you read his narrative in, in Democracy in America. And at one point in the book, he said, I know where C, the federal power. For in America, all men are self-governing. He says, I go into the most remote cabin in the Smoky Mountains of, of Kentucky. And he says, if I find nothing else on the fireplace, I find a copy of the King James Bible and the collected works of William Shakespeare. And all Americans are fluent in both. And all men above the age of 18 are lawyers. You see, in America, you couldn't plead ignorance of the law is no excuse because you had a copy of it on the mantelpiece. It was called the Bible. But today's Christian, you start talking about law and actually living according to God's law, you know, the first thing you hear is what? Oh, that's legalism, John. You've got to be careful. Man, that's big, bad stuff. Well, first of all, they don't understand the definition of legalism, which is the belief that you can have salvation by works and that not of grace or faith. And secondly, they don't understand the fact that our whole history is based on men willing to shed blood and die to maintain the sanctity of God's law in opposition to all others. Now... Invariably, you confront the modern Christian with the fact that his first law is God's law, and he will invariably say, we live under grace, John, don't you know? We don't live under law. 
then will you please have the common decency to admit to me that you're utterly lawless? What are you saying? You have set grace against law. Think, people, the opposite of grace is no grace and you are dead in your sins. The opposite of law is lawlessness. They have set up a false dichotomy and the Christian churches are preaching this filth across this country and they've effectively taken the entire Christian population of this nation and removed them from the battle. How many of you will die tonight? How many? What does it take, people? Oh, John, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Lord's coming back next Wednesday at 12.15. No, no, it's 12.22. I won't debate the point with you people, but I will say that that whole system of thought was condemned as a heresy in the second century by men much wiser than me. It was condemned by the great reformers. And that whole system of thought has effectively removed the Christian church from the battle and the pastors have con they've compounded their sins by opting for a privilege called tax exemption in a 501c3. Now, do you know what that effectively means? Ecclesiastical jurisdiction is gone, people. It's gone. You signed it away when you got your 501c3s. Ecclesiastical jurisdiction? What's that? You remember Manuel Noriega? Where'd he go hide? Why? Because he knew that the most powerful army in the world would not dare step across the borders of the ecclesiastical jurisdiction established by the church in which Manuel Noriega hid out. Until 1913, 14, 15, every Christian church in this country had that same power. Its grounds and, and, and property were utterly sacrosanct. And you want to know something else? Every member of every church whose names appeared on the roll of that church came under the protection of the ecclesiastical government and had the same rights, privileges, and immunities as the church. Now, what did that mean? Well, it meant lodial title, for one thing, to property. Ever heard of a lodial title? A-L-L-O-D-I-A-L? -L -L? You know what that means? Look it up in Black's Law Dictionary. A lodial title, property held in one's own absolute right without fees and duties payable to any lord or superior. Does that mean no property taxes? <laughs> now, see, in England, people, only the king could hold a lodial title to property. Everyone else paid feudal duties. They had tenure granted by the king, which could be given or taken away according to how well you supported the king and his program. The Congress, after the war, the colonial war, and the Constitution, the Congress passed in one 20-year span 13 laws guaranteeing a lodial title to every man, woman, and child. Now, perhaps you understand why every man's home was his castle in America. Because he had the same prerogatives and rights as the king. Now, how many people today have the same prerogatives and rights? Let's see all these kings. Uh, is there anybody here? That's... Hello, serfs. <laughs> Resident, alien, subjects, slaves, and serfs. You can't get quiet title to your automobile. You can't get a lodial title to your land. And you paid all that price, people. 
including the taxes. And remember, the rule is if you pay taxes on it, you don't own it. Somebody else does. You're paying all this out, and you wonder why and how is it, is it going to end? When is it going to... The government isn't going to voluntarily give back anything. Hand says in the 1947 court decision, you must be a belligerent claimant in person to assert your constitutional rights, or you have none. There isn't a man, woman, and child in this room who, if he doesn't assert his rights, excuse me, assert his rights, are, do you honestly expect the court to help you maintain the law? Why should they? There aren't any courts at law. You heard me right. There isn't any court of law left in the United States. Why? Are, do you honestly expect the court to help you maintain the law? Why should they? There aren't any courts at law. You heard me right. There isn't any court of law left in the United States. Why? Because the United States is in bankruptcy and receivership. It's under martial law and vice admiralty and thus Every court in the United States is an administrative tribunal under admiralty, martial law, commerce, bankruptcy, and receivership. Like a friend of mine says, John, well, I went, went to court with him one time, his, and his little girl went with us. <laughs> and he says, John, he says, this is going to be kind of tough for me, okay? Understand, you want to take care of my daughter while I'm doing the thing? And I, and I said, yes, of course. And she's sitting there and she turns around and she looks at me. She says, Mr. Quaid, isn't that flag pretty? Look at that gold fringe around it. And I said, I beg your pardon, darling? And she says, Mr. Quaid, look at that flag up there by the judge's bench. Look how pretty it is. It has all that gold fringe around it and everything. Isn't that pretty? How do you tell a child but that's a battle flag because the courts are invading and the instrument of tyranny of a Congress that sits unlawfully, of a president who styles himself as a quaint king. I mean, how do, how do you tell anybody that? How do you explain to it? Her dad just goes in there and gets ripped off for $147 on a traffic citation that he doesn't owe. You see? And the conservative movement in America, just to show you how intellectually bankrupt the whole conservative movement is, and stop and think now, you got all the Christians that are waiting for the Lord to come back next Wednesday at 1215, excuse me, 1222, and you got all the conservatives that don't understand the difference between revolution, you see, and Christian warfare, because they've forgotten the, th the theology of John Knox, <laughs> And the conservatives are all running around saying, we're going to recapture the country. We're going to bring everything back together. We're going to do this, and we're going to do that. And we got to elect Ronald Reagan, and we got to keep George Bush in office, and we can't let them nasty liberals get in office or anything else. And the bottom line is they're all intellectually bankrupt. They only pay lip service. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And we don't have guts enough to collectively indict every single one of them for treason. The only guy I know who ever did that has been a hunted man for the last five years. But the rest of the American people don't care enough. You see? We're all crying about law enforcement and the police and everything else and what kind of a job they're supposed to be doing. When in when in God's name is a police officer, why is he someone else's guardian, keeper on the highways? What is a police officer doing on the highways? I had a, the sheriff in Roseman, California, seven months ago, made a confession in my front yard because I confronted him with the fact that the sheriff at one time was a common law office. 
and now it has been compromised. And he said, I know that, John. And I said, then what does that make you? And he kind of looked a little embarrassed, looked down at things a little bit. He said, I'm a revenue officer for the bureaucrats. You deserve the drug dealers in your neighborhood, people, because your cops are out playing revenue officers for bureaucrats. You deserve to have your daughters raped and your sons violated by homosexuals. You deserve to have your wife attacked on some street corner and have her property seized and be beaten to a pulp. You yourself, as the head of household, deserve to be strung up and have unseemly things done to your person in the private parts. We are all guilty of having redefined what a law enforcement officer is, and thus we don't have anyone to blame but ourselves. And the conservatives, with their intellectual stupidity, who are always concerned about seizing the moment, seizing the agenda and everything else, have, since 1868, utterly botched the job of even understanding where history's going. I think some of the guys have probably already talked about what happened with the 14th Amendment. I'm going to rehash it just a minute before I close. The 14th Amendment of these United States was passed in 1868. It was the first Civil Rights Act. Now, of course, in order to get it onto the floor of the Senate, they had to unconstitutionally unseat several senators. And all this is a matter of public record. It's not my opinion. You can read the congressional record where it's all been rehashed. You can read court decisions where it's been rehashed and everything else. They go through it. Everybody knows that the 14th Amendment was unconstitutionally passed and that all the southern states were held under gunpoint to guarantee their signatures, the signature of their legislators. You see, the entire 14th Amendment was a fraud perpetrated at gunpoint on the American people. Now the historians and the boys out there in Hollywood, and the girls I guess too, uh, and various other individuals in the media will all tell us that the 14th Amendment gave citizenship to black people and the American dream is now possible for them. Biggest damn lie that ever came down the pike. Because what the 14th Amendment did, it gave citizenship not as a right, but as a privilege to non-whites. Read Title 42, Section 1981 sometime. Go to your local library and pull it down and read it. You'll get the whole story in there. And all these liberals, neo-Marxists, left-wing, and pseudo-compassionate conservatives who are so concerned about the rights of minorities in this country are liars, they are vipers, they are thieves, robbers, and rapists of the worst sort. Because what the Congress could have done in 1868 was very simply said, the rights, privileges, and immunities of the common law shall not be denied to any person on account of race. But then if they had done that, they would have given black people and every other minority in this country citizenship as a right of birth and not a privilege. Now, why is it important? Because in American law, only privileges can be taxed. Rights cannot be taxed. Only privileges, benefits, or opportunities can be taxed. <coughs> Hundreds of court cases to substantiate that. The only trick for the Congress was, okay, let's see, we got all the uh, Negroids, and we've got all the Orientals, and some of these South Sea Island tribes. And, uh, we got the Indians taken care of. How do we get them whites out there, man? That's the next thing we got to do. Get the whites. Get the whites to do what? To voluntarily give up their rights, that's what because they can't take them away from you. Ah. Piece of cake. Piece of cake. Problem's all taken care of. 
Let's see. The United States government owes it, and every American is entitled to Social Security. Everyone is entitled to Social Security. It isn't going to cost you that much. One percent, percent, half maybe, two percent. It wasn't the fact that it only cost you one and a half or two percent, and the fact that you deserve or don't deserve Social Security wasn't the problem. It was a contract, people. A contract. And as soon as the white people in this country signed their life, liberties, and properties over to the federal government through the 1938 Social Security Tax Act, it was over and done with. The New World Order had already arrived. It had all the power it needed. It had all the legislative history it needed. And it had the full cooperation of the American people. It was already here. Because you would not have this man known as Jesus Christ to rule over you. You preferred the providence of a politician to the law of God. And as to whether any, any, anyone here would step outside the hall tonight, or whether in here he would pledge his life, his fortune, and his sacred honor, that's not a question I can ask. And it's not a demand that I can make of anyone. As to whether liberty is worth dying for, I'm not sure there's enough Americans that are committed or even understand what it is. But I know what happened at Lexington and Concord. And they apparently believed that it was worth it. Because Hancock and Adams sneak into the home of Jonas Clark the night before the British came down the road through Lexington to Concord to seize the arms and powder there. And they snuck into Pastor Clark's house because they wanted to a couple of questions answered. Will they stand? Do they know their Christian duty? You see, the theology of John Knox was very well taught in America, and Pastor Clark affirmed the fact that they all knew their John Knox. And Knox very simply said, no Christian can engage in aggressive warfare. The only kind of warfare in which a Christian can engage is in defense of a just cause, and then only after his blood has been shed. Pastor Clark assured them that they understood Knox fully. The next morning, the British come marching down the road to Concord. And the 70-odd men stood there on the green at Lexington. The history books don't often tell you this, but it was the green in front of the Lexington Congregational Church. And the commander of the Grenadiers ordered them to disperse. And they did not. And they all stood there with their weapons at ease. Three times he ordered them to disperse. Then he ordered his men to assume the position. And they cut him down. Our fathers then returned one volley and retired from the field. And to this day, the historians don't understand why that happened. I've never seen a Hollywood portrayal of that event. I can tell you why it happened. For all of us who know our Christian history, it happened very simply because they preferred to die for the rights of God than the privileges of men. But they had to first voluntarily shed their blood and allow their lives to be taken. So they stood there on the green at Lexington and they wet it with their blood and gave up their life. She watched from across the road. And the British had done their deed and marched on down the road. She ran up to the pastor and she grabbed his sleeve and tore it off. And she says, there, Jonas Clark, are you satisfied with what your preaching has done? And he looked at her and he only had one answer, name Adam. 
I am not sorry. For from this day, the world will mark the birth of liberty. Where are the men of today with the medal of Jonas Clark? As a friend of mine asked me, where are the leaders? And I had to tell him because we don't deserve them. We don't deserve them because we don't have the steel in our backbone. And we may call ourselves patriots, call ourselves Christians, and call ourselves a lot of other things. But by our fruits we are known. Profession is worthless. James says, show me your works, and then I will say you have faith. We in America have been blessed more than any other nation on the face of this planet. So much is given, much is required. Every man, woman, and child in this country bears the responsibility for the blood of the infants and the elderly, for the property that's been seized. drugs, we all bear the same responsibility. And unless we are willing, unless we are willing to choose which God we are going to serve and serve Him faithfully, then we deserve every possible evil and corruption that could possibly befall a nation. Christians, you're going to have to stand up and accept responsibility. You're going to have to be self-governing men who are willing to say, to God's law and no further. Christian wives, you're going to have to stand beside the man, support him wherein he leads to Jesus Christ, gently resist him where he does not, and remind him. You're going to have to bring up your children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, specifically in terms of law. By what standard will you govern your life? It won't, if it won't be God's law, by whose? That's our calling. That is what we must do. We must go back to the law. David says in the Psalms, how I love the law. He goes through this whole dissertation and ends it by saying, how I love the law. And no one today do I hear saying that. I don't hear anyone singing Onward Christian Soldiers anymore. And we used to sing that song because we were a church on the march against which the gates of hell shall not prevail. The bottom line is, people, that we will either voluntarily repent of our sins, come back to God's law, or we shall be condemned out of our own minds to suffer the fate of all those who've gone before us and didn't change. You see, when you look at the decline of the American system and wonder where it went, and to restore it, you need to look no further than the scriptures that God has given us. And remember, you either stand or fall. You either are either the Christian and the patriot worthy of carrying the burden or you're worthless, you're chat, you're tears. It doesn't take a lot of men. It didn't take Gideon very many men. And it won't take us a lot of men. Because there's plenty of people out there today that are standing in the gap. Remember, people, we didn't have any military in 1742 when the French fleet set out to raise the colony, but we went into the streets in sackcloth and ashes, and we fasted and prayed, and God delivers, delivered us. And He will do so again. If we repent, seek his faith and pray, and cling to the law, 
I thank you all very much for allowing me to come here tonight. I don't, I don't have the time to go out here. Uh,